Good morning, everyone. You are nice and quiet this morning. Everybody trying to be good? I think you're all good. What, what a joy it is to be here with you in church on Christmas Eve. Uh, it's, it's great to see all of your smiling faces, all of you here, all of you out on Facebook and, and YouTube. Uh, welcome, welcome. And speaking of welcome, tonight, 7 o'clock, Christmas Eve. You can see the bell tables are set up. We'll have bells, special music, the word, the story. Everyone is welcome. So come on back at 7 o'clock tonight here. A couple of other announcements. On the uh, usher's table over here is a paper that gives Dottie's covered supplies. We're still filling Dottie's cupboard several days a week and these food items and personal care items are always in need so we these flyers are on the ushers table and if you don't have one I encourage you to get one and and we like all the help we can get in getting supplies for Dottie's cupboard the church is beautiful thank you to everyone who contributed to uh, getting the poinsettias and everyone that worked on setting the church up in, in this beautiful, beautiful setting here on Christmas Eve. I'm going to stop talking now. Courtney has an announcement. I hope you guys can see me. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Courtney Watkins, and I've been thinking about trying to get an adult Bible study going on Tuesday evenings. For those of you who can't make it to Bible study at 11 o'clock on Thursday, it'll have a slightly different vibe. Um, I'm thinking we could gather at Compadres on Tuesday nights. It's Taco Tuesday, so you'd get three tacos for $7, and we get to talk about some cool stuff. Um, I have a deep love of the Old Testament. I know Preston has mentioned that I studied Hebrew, and I would like to know what you have a deep love for. So I want to gauge some interest, see who would be willing to have some tacos and testaments on Tuesday nights. So after church on Sunday the 14th, so that's three Sundays from now, we're going to gather in the library for just a who's interested, who might come, and then I can also let compadres know roughly how many people will be showing up. Um, so we could try and get started. Bring some ideas of what you'd like to study, what kind of questions you have, and I would love to explore and delve into that with you. Thank you. My turn, hope to be brief. As someone who uh, was in charge of the HALO program for many years, coordinating things, um, you can see that the HALO tree is still over there next to the uh, pulpit. Uh, it is in fact empty except for the lights. Uh, the presents have all been delivered. Uh, as I understand it, the families were extremely appreciative. I wanted to take uh, a minute and thank all of you tremendously for your efforts. Um, it was. Uh, it, it always is a challenge, um, but we manage to come through in one way or another. We get all the presents purchased, wrapped, and delivered to the families. Last year, I asked uh, a couple who's relatively new to our church. Uh, most of you have seen them and know Jim and Lori Van Der Did I get that close? Van Der Schleuschweer? Okay, thank you. I've been practicing that. Um, I asked them to walk beside me to see if possibly they would be interested in taking on the responsibility. And this year, after they walked beside me last year, I addressed things early in the fall and said, are you willing and interested in doing it this year? And they said, yes. And while there are always some changes and some differences <laughs> when, when coordinating an event like that or, or a, a thing like that happens, um, I think it went extremely well and I thank them for their efforts, everything from contacting HALO initially to get the families, to contacting the families to get their information for their needs and their desires, 
to do, making out the bells, getting them on the tree, making sure that you folks were aware of what was happening and, and uh, took your bells, purchased your gifts, brought them in wrapped, and organizing them downstairs is never an easy chore, but they did all of that with very little guidance from me. They simply took the, re the information that they gleaned from last year. And again, I want to thank them for that. And uh, as time goes on, we'll see what next year brings. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Jim and Lori. And I echo what Tim said. Thank you very much. I, I was able to be here during the gift distribution, and the, uh, the, the families were extremely appreciative and thankful for your generosity. So the, uh, we, filled, we filled cars up with gifts, and it, it, was, it was just wonderful. Uh, a word about the service, just a reminder, nothing new, but uh, after the offering, after the prayer of dedication, please remain standing and the doxology, well, after the doxology, which is today the fourth verse of the first Noel, then we will remain standing and pastor will lead us in our statement of faith and the worship service will continue from there. So once again, it's, it's great to be here with you. Uh, we have, we are very blessed here in our church. And the prelude is an example of that as we get a piano and organ duet. Uh, Clay and Mary playing, it came upon the midnight clear. So uh, would you all rise as you can as we welcome the light of Christ into our service. Well, I, I cut the pastor out. He probably wants to say something. I apologize. Do you have anything you'd like to say before we start? He does. It's a shock. I apologize. We talked about this. Well. I know we did. <laughs> I just got my hand slapped. Um, good, morning. good morning. A blessing is always to be with you this Advent morning. A weird one of those days where it's Advent in the morning, Christmas Eve in the evening. Um, I just have one quick announcement, and that is that uh, this Wednesday is we are cutting off sign-ups for our outing to the Cleveland Cavaliers game. Uh, they're on January 5th. They're, the Wizards are coming to town, taking them on, and we figured it'd be a fun outing to go out and see them together as a church family. So if you would like to go, you must let the main office know by Wednesday. All right? Now... I ask you to remain standing physically or spiritually as you were able as we meditate to music and invite the light of Christ onto our altar this morning.
When the angel Gabriel visited Mary, announcing God's plan for her to conceive and give birth to the Messiah, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And yet, only a few months later, Mary was to sing this to Elizabeth. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. We, like Mary, hear God's call to be part of making God's dream for our salvation and flourishing a reality. And we question, how can this be? I am only, yet like Mary, the onlys that make us hesitate are gifts God can and will use as God's love transforms us into bearers of good news. Wait as people who have encountered divine love that disrupts the status quo and ushers us into abundant life marked by mutual love and peace that flows from the flourishing of all people. We light these candles as signs of our shocking hope. Our just peace. Our fierce joy, and the love that transforms us. May love grow within us, transforming us into bold witnesses of God's salvation with our voices and our lives. Amen. Join with me now for our call to worship, which we will read responsively in your bulletin and on the screen. Stop, listen, pay attention. Love is coming near. The hope bringer, peacemaker, joy sustainer grows in a womb preparing to be born among us. With Mary, we long for the coming of the child who will transform the world, bring justice where injustice reigns, fullness where hunger persists, and favor to the ones the world calls lowly. So let us join our voices and our lives in magnifying God, our Savior. We come to and declare the coming of the Lord that us. Amen. Our first hymn, While Angels Watched Their Flocks, number 236.
be seated. <clears throat> Our first scripture this morning come, comes from the book of Psalm. <clears throat> Psalm 89, the first four verses, and then verses 19 through 26. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Once you spoke in a vision to your faithful people, you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have exalted a young man from among the people. I have found David my servant. With sacred oil, I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen. No enemy will subject him to tribute. No wicked man will oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name, his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, you are my father, my God, my rock, my savior. This is the word of God for the people of God. I now invite the ushers to make collections of our tithes and offerings.
Gracious and loving God, it is by being in contact with your divine, transforming love that has changed us and spurred us and has led us to give as we do. We ask that you then receive these, our humble tithes and offerings, that you may also transform them in your love, that they may deepen and in their impact make it more on earth here in Ashtabula, Ohio, as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Now I invite us to join together in the Apostles' Creed, found both 881 of your hymnals and on the screens. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come together for our time of communal prayer, I invite you, if you have a need, you may fill out a prayer card, uh, email, uh, instant message, or even call the church with whatever joy or concern is on your heart, and we will walk and pray with you, for no one goes through this life alone. I have a few joys that have made it onto our list this morning that I would wish to share with you. One uh, is that... Uh, well, Courtney graduated in August, but last week we got to celebrate her receiving uh, her degree, her Master's of Social Work in West Virginia University, um, and it was really a, it was a divine moment, it really was, um, because we're having dinner and you can hear students talk about, oh, the president's doing this and he's mismanaging that and the school's enrollment is going down and, I, and they're snubbing him for handshakes, you know, and he's trying to give hugs and they're walking by him and whatnot. But at the end, I don't know if you know what they do in West Virginia, but at the end, John Denver's Country Road starts playing over the loudspeaker. And they join hands, they link arms, and they sway back and forth. President and student, disgruntled faculty member and parent, they all sang Country Roads. That there are still some things that do bind us together, uh, whether we might initially on the surface call it John Denver or call it the love of something greater. It was a God sighting indeed. Also, uh, little Jack has gone on to the district spelling bee. Next month he will be competing with uh, students from all over, and so we will, uh, one, we praise God for his success, and we will ask that God be with him as he continues the next step of that competition. My friends, let us be in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks to you that as we wait for the arrival of your Son, we have already been blessed to see the glimpses of your heaven here breaking through on your earth. For the moments of joy and hope and love and peace that you have comforted us with. In a world filled with violence and folks with nothing good to say, but instead of keeping it in, they say it anyway. The, the people who endanger other folks that you have given us moments. Like seeing families being given a Christmas they didn't know they were going to be able to provide for their family like folks locking arms and singing John Denver in a place where you never thought they'd link arms and, well, sing John Denver. To our loved ones who have been successful in the things they have worked for and have achieved, we praise you, O God, for these accomplishments, for the journeys both big and small. 
And we ask that you, along with all of our loved ones whom we hold in our hearts, that you will strengthen us and be with us as we take the next step in this journey you have called us to, wherever it may lead us. However big that step may be, whether we can see the ground underneath us or not, that you will be with us, that you will hold us, and that you will remind us time and time again, regardless of the circumstances, you love us. And so, O oh God, as we come and seek to be closer to you and as we await your advent among us in our lives, today we wish to make ourselves fully known to you, you who know our thoughts before we even think them. And so we come bearing our souls to you that you might rescue and restore us, that you might hold us and redeem us as we join together in our unison prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And we come to you in this silence, O oh God, with the hope that in here, in this place, you will encounter us. That we may be with you, that we may listen for you. For you alone have the power to hear the prayers that cling to the deepest parts of our souls. And you alone have the power to respond. My siblings, the Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And as we remember the promises God has given us, that we will triumph over both sin and death, that God has promised us a place at, table, at the table for we will be blessedly reunited with those who have gone before us. We join now in the prayer that Christ has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, choir. Our second scripture this morning, we turn to the gospel according to Luke, the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the, Holy, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who, said, she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Amen. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts who are gathered here be acceptable and pleasing unto you, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, my friends, we are here, just hours away from the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, and even still, we are waiting This morning has us creeping ever closer to the culmination of our Christmas story. And here we find God's messenger Gabriel coming to Mary to announce that she is favored, and she will bear a son whom she has to name Jesus. Her disbelief is understandable, uh, certainly as we read this with our 21st century eyes. What Mary does not yet realize is that the stage has been set for her to play a role in God's saving act. Her cousin, Elizabeth, is also six months pregnant. Her husband, Zechariah, received a message also from God's messenger, Gabriel. And Elizabeth, too, has become pregnant, and we learn that nothing is impossible for God. And so we sit here this Sunday in the space between Mary and Elizabeth's story between an elderly, barren Elizabeth and a teenage virgin Mary. In between them exist the impossible possibilities of God's power and abundance. It is in this space that we find a miracle so great that it testifies to the reality that Gabriel states to Zechariah, Mary, and to us today that nothing is impossible with God. So why is the setting up necessary? Why is it just as important for Elizabeth um, as for Mary's story to be rooted in impossibilities, things you and I say can't happen? Maybe It is to show us that between the extremes of Mary and Elizabeth, we find a God for whom all things are possible. That there is no miracle too big. That there is no despair too deep, no darkness too great, no pain too unbearable, no situation too hopeless, no person unlovable, and no sin unforgivable. And God is not just bound by the extremes we find in our story this morning, nor is he bound by the extremes we have in our own spiritual journeys. That there are seasons in our lives where we convince ourselves that our faith must be grounded in credulity and certainty. Holding this intention properly has led to amazing discoveries, uh, such as a learning more about the historical person of Jesus, and we can help pinpoint the journeys of Paul, and even we understand our faith, the Hebrew Bible, um, just even that much better. However, being certain of what we know is true and possible has a way of suffocating, ways for God to surprise us. But what if, what if we decided that our faith was something that we can hold and define loosely? What if, not to say it could not be articulated, you can say what you believe, but to say that God contains greater possibilities that we can even dream or imagine? 
that the mystery of God contains so much that has not been revealed to us and may never be revealed to us until our final days are numbered, that maybe our lives could be shaped in a way quoted by uh, Rob Bell as militant mysticism, being that we are absolutely sure of some things we don't quite know. What if living this kind of purposefully ambiguous faith where words and even understanding fall short could open space for God's Holy Spirit to move, to breathe, to expand? Do you see any way that this can change how we interact with the world, engage with our very own Christmas story, or even relate to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Phuc Tran is an author, classicist, and tattoo artist, Vietnamese-American. And Tran has a deep passion for grammar, and in particular, the indicative and the subjunctive. The indicative captures verbs as facts. I am speaking. The subjunctive holds within it tons of nuance, of possibilities and potentialities. The indicative says, I go there. But the subjunctive says, I could go there. I would go there. I might go there. Tran notes that this is a difference the English language has in, uh, to its Vietnamese counterpart. Tran tells a story as they were escaping South Vietnam. He cried so much that his family did not get on the particular bus meant for them. They stepped aside and figured they'd wait for the next one. Well, that bus pulls out. It leaves the city, gets struck by artillery fire, and all the people perish. Tran spent a good time when he was older and could reflect on it, pondering the possibilities, what were to happen. And he laments that his father could not ponder those possibilities in the same way. Tran uh, speaks of those differences in regards to conversations he'd have with his father, and he says, for my father, there were no alternate realities in 1975. Just what happened and what didn't happen. Even if he felt the pangs of losing a life he should have had, he didn't have the language to express it. In his memoir, Sai Gone, a misfits memoir of great books, punk rock, and the fight to fit in, he remarks about how the subjunctive was an oasis for him as he tried to adjust as a refugee in America. His ability to ponder the what-ifs gave him strength to survive the harsh indicative reality of leaving his homeland during a war-stricken time and then adjusting to rural Pennsylvania. It is the subjunctive that allowed him to think of himself not as what he was, but what he could be. My friends, the indicative roots us in reality. It tells us what happens and what doesn't happen. Even Phup Tran remarks that it helped his parents survive and provide for a family adjusting to a different way of life. However, to only dwell in the indicative, to only leap after you've looked, to only believe after you've seen, to only wait after you know precisely what is coming and how it is coming, to expect God to only operate in what is humanly possible. That is to trap our hearts and our minds in a way that prevents us from grasping at the alternate possibilities and accepting what is, and that is a broken world filled to the brim with violence, hatred, and its fair share of closed minds, closed hearts, and closed doors. But instead to grasp that it does not have to be like this. That it could be better. That it might be better. That the subjunctive allows us to embrace not just what is possible, but also what is impossible. 
and that our lesson from Mary and Elizabeth is that maybe our faith must dwell in between, dealing with things as they are, but seeing what they can be. And as we wait for just a few hours more in Advent, being open to see what God, the God we know, have always known, and who is guiding our future, can transform them to be. Amen. Friends, brothers, sisters, siblings, I invite you back in just a few hours, 7 p.m., when the sun finally hides and it gets a little colder and a little more uncomfortable, because it is in that moment where God is breaking through into our lives that you may come here in this place, and as you go out into the world, to see what would be, what could be, and what might be here in this subjunctive space in a pretty indicative world. So go now in the name of God who has made us in love. 
Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who comes to save us by his grace, and in the power of God's Holy Spirit that will strengthen and sustain us until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.